As schools go back, scientists refuse to back COVID jabs for all under 16s. The UK's vaccine advisory body says the health risks and benefits are too finely balanced, but they're prepared to be overruled by ministers. We want to see what wider societal and educational benefits there are to children before recommending universal vaccination. Also in News at 10 tonight. The cost of rescuing our overburdened care system. The government considers breaking its manifesto promise not to raise taxes. At least 48 lives are confirmed lost in the devastation wrought across America's northeast by Hurricane Ida. Alexander Coty, a member of the notorious group of British ISIS murderers, faces the families of those he helped to kill so barbarically. It was kind of rather sobering to think that any human being could have committed all the horrific things he pleaded guilty to. Yet again, FIFA is urged to tackle racism at its tournaments after last night's horrific abuse of Raheem Sterling by Hungary fans. And the family histories that lie buried, a seven-year project to digitise every graveyard in England. This is ITV News at 10 with Raggy Omar. Good evening. An enduring theme of the pandemic has been balancing risks and rewards. The pros and cons of easing restrictions being the ultimate example. Vaccines prove pivotal there, but it is those jabs themselves which are at the centre of the latest debate, namely whether they should be given to 12 to 15-year-olds. Today, the UK's vaccine advisory body chose not to recommend it on health grounds alone, given the low risk COVID poses to that age group and the outside chance of rare side effects. But that isn't the end of the matter. The UK's chief medical officers will now consider other factors before a final decision is made, like the disruption schools and parents may face if thousands of children must isolate this winter because they weren't vaccinated. Could that tip the balance? We'll find out very soon. Tests are about the only thing controlling COVID infection in schools. Now pupils are back across the UK. But the long-awaited decision on vaccines for all 12 to 15-year-olds will have to wait a little longer. The government's advisers deciding today the benefits for healthy children are just too marginal for approval on medical grounds alone. Whilst the benefits marginally outweigh the risks, the risk of heart inflammation is still uncertain. And we want to see what wider societal and educational benefits there are to children before recommending universal vaccination. In countries like the US, which has vaccinated millions of over 12s, the risk of heart inflammation called myocarditis and pericarditis is rare and generally short-lived. Cases in double-jabbed American boys are around 66 per million. In girls, even rarer, around nine cases per million. The JCVI says it wants three months more follow-up data to rule out any long-term risk. It's now up to the chief medical officers of the four nations to decide whether the non-medical benefits of vaccinating children, like their education, outweigh any potential risks. Children have had huge levels of disruption, and that's not just been missing school. It's been missing sports, it's been missing plays, it's been missing the playground, and we really want to not have that disruption this term. So I think that, that question has to loom large for the chief medical officers. But today the committee did update its advice to recommend jabs for around 200,000 more over 12s at higher risk of COVID, including those with certain lung, kidney and liver diseases and type 1 diabetes like 14-year-old Poppy Sheridan. I would definitely want to get the vaccine because it would provide me with a lot more security knowing that I wouldn't get as sick with COVID and it would just provide more closure and just security. And there's a certain level of frustration Hello, good evening. that other the countries UK's have been vaccinating healthy 12 to 15 year olds without any underlying conditions. And there's been an impatience and frustration on my behalf that um, why can't we do it here? For healthy children, the risks and benefits are so finely balanced, it will take little to tip either way. But the importance of education is likely to weigh heavily in the decision. Tom Clark, News at 10. 
And to discuss this, I'm joined further by our deputy political editor, Anushka Astana. Anushka, I'm presuming that ministers are left pretty frustrated by this decision. Oh, yeah. I've heard a lot of grumbles about this committee because ministers are thinking about the politics. So, for example, I've heard them say, our constituents want advice on boosters or it's ridiculous that 17-year-olds are only having one jab. Or today, members of the Cabinet saying to me that they are very frustrated. They are worried about those potential disruptions that you were hearing about. And they also think that this could help to protect adults. Now, as you know, the committee were not considering those other factors. And one source in Whitehall was really, really keen to stress that to me today, to say, look, this is not a no. Even on the narrower question, they say that the benefits outweigh the risks. And I'm hearing a similar thing from the opposition. I was talking to Labour's shadow education secretary tonight, Kate Green. Yes, she's worried about other things like ventilation. But on this point, she thinks it's building up to quite a strong case for vaccinations. Now, the chief medical officers are going to be quick about this. We've been told we could have a decision next week. And sources say that if that happens, then they are ready to go with the programme in schools. They will, of course, need parental consent in all cases. But if it's a yes, that will happen. If it's a no, those frustrations may boil over. We'll soon know. Thank you very much, Anushka. Now, anyone watching the programme last night will have seen Paul Brand's heartbreaking report into the impact social care staff shortages are having. The question is what can be done about problems across the sector. Boris Johnson pledged to reform it in his 2019 manifesto. Well, to keep that promise, he may have to break another by raising taxes. There was no denial today that a national insurance hike could be used to foot the bill, and it's feared the young will pay the heaviest price. Multiple sclerosis has taken its toll on Ruth Green. She can no longer feed herself. She pays for this care privately, but knows others simply can't afford it. Money. They don't give anyone enough money. It's terrible. The government should help people. They should. They should help people. He pledged to do so, but in his 2019 manifesto, he also promised not to raise taxes. It seems that's a promise he's now prepared to break. The British public know that uh, re reforming social care will come at a cost, and therefore it's important for all of us to uh, be straight with the British public. You're not denying then that national insurance could rise? I'm not going to speculate as to uh, the nuts and bolts of it. Uh, what I do know is it's important that we have a grown-up conversation about social care. At least £10 billion a year more is needed for social care. A 1% increase in national insurance, one option. It would mean on an average salary of just under £30,000, you'd pay nearly £200 a year extra. Ministers know some backbenchers dislike the idea of raising national insurance, but what about those who could end up paying more? If it's a small increase, it creates a, a, a good impact, then why not? We pay a lot of tax anyway. Um, I don't know, another tax rise, I don't know. You don't mind spending a bit more on tax if you can actually see what your money is, is paying for and what it's going towards. Meanwhile, in the care sector, they say the funding crisis is so acute, reform can't come soon enough. I don't know of one provider at the moment who isn't absolutely screaming for, you know, intervention and funding to solve the problem. It's, it's not viable. It's a sector that's been creaking for many years, very fragile post-COVID, and now it's, it's, it's critical. We're, we're, a, we're at a cliff edge moment. They clapped for carers. The question now, are they ready to raise taxes to help them? Libby Vina, News at 10, Westminster. Abroad now, Storm Ida has left a trail of destruction across the United States all week. Tonight, President Biden is in Louisiana surveying the damage from when the then hurricane made landfall on Sunday. In the past 36 hours, the focus has moved more than 1,000 miles to the U.S.'s northeast, where flooding and tornadoes have left at least 48 people dead. In some places, the full extent of the damage remains hidden beneath the waters. America has been overwhelmed by the epic scale of Ida. In Bridgewater, New Jersey, the floods have consumed vast swathes of land. This baseball stadium, now a monument to a crisis which came with a speed and ferocity few predicted. On Rhode Island, solid tarmac was left riven with huge cracks and undermined by sinkholes after the waters subsided. Infrastructure which will take months to repair, which was smashed in seconds.
Near New York City, a major railway line remains blocked by a landslide. Cars tumbled into a canyon of soil, which was gouged out by the rain in minutes. The grounds of a nearby apartment block are covered in dangerous fissures, a garden re-landscaped by the force of nature. Satellite photos before and after the deluge depict entire neighbourhoods submerged. In Pennsylvania, you get a sense of the magnitude of this disaster. The water shows no sign of receding. Life has no chance of returning to these streets. Look! And Ferris! You have brain boots! Ashley Thomas was assessing the damage to her home in Mullica Hill, New Jersey this morning after narrowly escaping with her husband and two children. My house was falling on my back over my two small children. It was awful. So you and your family were trapped inside? In the basement, yeah, where you're supposed to be, where it's supposed to be safe. But this is why being anywhere underground was extremely dangerous. Nine centimetres of water an hour, overwhelming sewers with deadly consequences. In this basement in Queens, three people perished. So many were caught out by the speed of the rising flood. When I opened the door, the door got stuck too. So maybe because of the water pressure or something, I don't know why. And then we can't even go out. These are scenes which are becoming too familiar around the world as the most dire warnings of climatologists are starting to be borne out. Dan Rivers, News at 10. And still in the US, of all the horrors committed by Islamic State, the beheadings of hostages by a group of British jihadis known to their victims as the Beatles stood out for their barbarity. Last night in a US court to which he was extradited, a member of that group, Alexander Cote, admitted helping to torture and murder four Americans. His punishment? Life in prison. One condition of his plea, though, is that he meets the families of those men and women the group so callously and brutally killed in the Syrian desert. The daughter of murdered British aid worker David Haynes told us she now hopes Cote will reveal from where her father's remains might be recovered. They are the faces of some of those Alexander Cote kidnapped, tortured and condemned to death. Aid workers, journalists, British, American and Japanese. For the families of the American dead, this was the first chance to see the man who inflicted such horror as he admitted his crimes against them. The justice, fairness, and humanity that this defendant received in the United States stand in stark contrast to the cruelty, inhumanity, and indiscriminate violence touted by the terrorist organization that he espoused. So many miles from the Syrian battlefield where he was the one in judgment, Koti admitted guilt, but without any obvious trace of it. The court was told Cote was part of the so-called Beatles ISIS cell from London. Under a plea deal for the Americans, he admitted eight counts of conspiracy to kidnap and commit murder. This plea deal means that Cote can return to the UK in 15 years to serve out his sentence. But for that to even be a possibility, he's had to agree to speak with the families who wish to speak to him, to explain how he kidnapped their relatives, brutalised them and sent them to their deaths. James Foley was one of those killed. His family were amongst those in court to see Cote plead guilty. This is the first time we'd ever seen Alexander Cote. Um, it was kind of rather sobering to think that any human being could have committed all the horrific things he pleaded guilty to. Do you want to meet him? I think so. Because I, I really, I guess it's hard for me uh, to I understand to anyone just into um, us here at the BBC like Alexander. Geronimo, uh, and the alpaca I do have some questions I'd like to ask of him, if I can. If I, a court if I can summon the courage to. Warrant was Today, the daughter of David Haynes, the murdered uh, British the hostage, once again pleaded for detail as to where her father's body um, is. That torment is shared by so many of these families as they consider whether to meet Cote, a man who will be given a life sentence rather than the death sentence he placed on those they love. Emma Murphy, News at 10, in the United States. 
Events in Hungary last night were sadly predictable, weren't they? Even before England's footballers were booed for taking the knee, there were suspicions the evening would not pass without racism, once again rearing its ugly head. The hosts' fans have form. UEFA ordered that three of Hungary's matches must be played behind closed doors because of it. But this was a FIFA game, making that ruling meaningless. Tens of thousands were allowed in and a small minority hurled abhorrent abuse. FIFA has promised adequate actions, whatever that means. It should have been a moment of celebration, but once again, a young black British player found themselves running into a barrage of missiles and racist abuse. There have been missiles thrown, and sad to report some monkey chanting from the supporters in the ultra section. The chants were directed at Raheem Sterling and substitute Jude Bellingham. Today, Bellingham called for tougher action, tweeting, part of the game and always will be until proper punishments are put in place by those with the power. Hungary's fans had been banned from the stadium for three matches by the European governing body UEFA for discriminatory behaviour during Euro 2020. But because this was a World Cup qualifying match controlled by FIFA, they were allowed back in. A decision condemned by those campaigning against discrimination in European football. It's ridiculous that we have a big match against a racially diverse team like England and there was no consideration given of the need to have a look at the, the dangers of the match and to apply the ban that they are facing from UEFA. And it's saved by Donnarumma. Hungary's foreign minister hit back, accusing England of double standards. He pointed to the missed penalties at the Euro final, which resulted in black stars facing a torrent of online abuse. It also inspired three women to set up a petition for tougher sanctions against racist behaviour like that witnessed in Budapest. It was disgusting and ugly, and it's very easy to identify those individuals because the world's TV cameras captured what was happening to Raheem Sterling and to, to Jude Bellingham and to other, uh, others on the pitch. And it's very easy to identify them, and it's very easy to hold them to account. Tonight, FIFA confirmed it had opened disciplinary proceedings into these latest scenes of racism to haunt football. Juliet Bremner, News at 10. One of the UK's main providers of flu vaccines has said deliveries to GPs are to be delayed because of the ongoing shortages of lorry drivers. Sequiris has said there will be delays of up to two weeks in England and Wales, and meaning that some patient appointments will have to be rescheduled. The company said it was due to unforeseen challenges and was working hard to resolve the issue. One group representing GPs says it's causing a great deal of uncertainty for patients. Ever since the last US troops flew out of Afghanistan on Monday night, the world has been watching to see what the Taliban will do next. One obvious item on its agenda is the formation of a new government, something we're still waiting for. It's thought resistance to the Taliban from fighters in the Panjshir Valley has held that announcement up. There have been more fierce battles in the region today, but tonight the Taliban is claiming victory. Intense gunfire over Kabul tonight. Celebrations to mark what was claimed to be the fall of the final province resisting a total takeover. But the anti-Taliban fighters in the northeast of Afghanistan said these shots were premature. <laughs> this is the last major holdout against Taliban rule. Panjshir is mountainous and almost inaccessible. As Soviet forces found before, and the Taliban now, it's Afghanistan's valley of resistance. Armed fighters say they're holding back their opponents, despite their claims. This is the man expected to lead the new Taliban government when it's announced imminently. Mullah Baradar was one of the group's founders, but was freed from jail at the request of the Americans. From a Pakistani prison to a presidential palace, his appointment worries those hoping for a break with the past. As we've said, and as countries around the world have said, uh, there is an expectation that um, uh, any government that emerges now uh, will uh, have some real inclusivity and in that it will have uh, non-Talibs in it who are representative of 
different uh, communities and different uh, interests in, in Afghanistan. So we'll see what in fact emerges. In Doha, we spoke to Afghans who escaped last week and who are watching news back home with dread. Do you trust a government led by Mullah Baradar? We are against this. Our parents didn't teach us this, that live under someone, uh, sy uh, under some system that which came through weapon. But the Taliban support is needed to resume the evacuations. The foreign secretary was in Pakistan today, Afghanistan's neighbor, to find a way to help get people out of Kabul. That may be possible uh, via Kabul airport in the near future. I've been to Qatar to discuss that. But obviously, uh, there are routes via third countries. Uh, that's why I'm here on the ground looking at uh, the vantage point here at Torkham. In the Afghan capital today, women protested demanding their rights. It is here on the streets of Kabul where demands of the Taliban are being made in the boldest terms by the bravest people. Rohit Katru, News at 10, Doha. Dozens of nations were involved in operations in Afghanistan over the past 20 years, and within the ranks of the British forces were plenty recruited abroad. Some made the ultimate sacrifice. 33 of the 457 British servicemen and women killed were foreigners. For our series Afghanistan Photo from the Front Line, John Ray spoke to two South African recruits who fought with C Company, Ryan Brotherton and Carl Deerens. They put their lives on the line for the cause one bitterly opposed by their own government. Monumental reminders of Britain's war spread far around the globe. So how many blokes you reckon on this war? The names of those who shed their blood are written in stone. Check there's also a Jackson there. And carved into the memories of the men who risked their lives for a foreign land. You know, like they called us the colonials across the battalion. I think there was a, at least a South African in every company. Kyle and Ryan were among the many Commonwealth soldiers to serve in Afghanistan. Though in their native South Africa, some saw them as mercenaries. It was a time when it was voiced that we may lose our South African citizenship you know, um, if, we cons if we decided to stay in the British military. My mentality during that process was, well, I am fighting for a good cause. So if they want to persecute me and prosecute me, then so be it. They fought at Sangin, then the most dangerous outpost in the British Army. I remember getting contacts up to five, six times a day. So guys were ready to go. We trained for this. Like we want to be in the thick of it. This is Kyle, filmed by ITV News back in that long, hot summer of 2006. The Taliban, a constant threat. Like any of the blokes, we all had our close shaves. The mortars was probably for me the worst. Um, and you could hear them, but you couldn't see them. Just, just like, where, the, where those landed was just pure luck. Luke McCulloch was one of Kyle's best friends. Brought up in South Africa, the two bonded. Gentle, really gentle soul. Always laughing, always laughing. In September 2006, Luke's luck ran out. One of those mortars exploded close to the spot where the two friends had just been chatting. Yeah, it was very surreal. It doesn't make any sense. How can you be talking to someone 10 minutes earlier and then, you know, and then later on you find out you're never gonna to talk to them again. If someone died, you're gonna have that natural guilt. Why him and not me? Did we verbalize it? I didn't hear blokes verbalize it. But I know inside, we all had that guilt, you know? Why was it him and not me? Ryan is still haunted by the death of his comrade, Damien Jackson. The 19 years old when he was killed. That bloke didn't even, you know, didn't even live his life. He's 19. That's what I found hard. You would have swapped places with him? 100%. All of us would have. Not just myself. I'm sure I'm speaking on most of the blokes. Oh, hello, boy. After Afghanistan, you? the two men took different paths. Better than last time. So how was the athletics? Good. Huh? Good. Kyle runs a school. You have to control the principal. Ryan has a security company. We're going to say down, sir. But neither can quite leave Helmand and the paras behind. Yeah, when you leave, you at you, six you, drug deaths you go is from here to zero, and and all of a sudden, all those things that you've done doesn't really mean anything. Um, 
And so that, that was very difficult for me, and I know it was very difficult for a lot of guys. And back in South Africa, there was little in the way of help. You know, there isn't a number to dial. Good evening. We've had friends who've struggled, um, and guys who've been injured, um, and you're just not going to get the support here at all, no. Get down, get down, get down, get down. Do I suffer from trauma? I'm sure everyone suffered from trauma from Afghanistan. You just put your emotions aside. Remember, you're taught in the military to put your emotions inside because if you make a, a, a call or a, a judgment on emotion, it generally, it generally doesn't work out for you. In their homeland, these men will never be viewed as heroes, but the debt of gratitude owed by Britain is just as great. Good evening and welcome to the BBC. John Ray, News at 10, Johannesburg. A prominent member of the QAnon conspiracy group has accepted a plea deal for his involvement in January's U.S. Capitol riots. Jacob Chansley, who was widely photographed in the Senate chamber, pleaded guilty to one count of obstruction in an official proceeding. He faces up to 50 months in prison, although he has already spent nearly eight months in jail since his arrest. Nearly 600 people have so far been charged in the investigation of the riot. It's taken just 10 days for Britain's Paralympians to claim 100 medals in Tokyo. They went past that milestone and on to 111 today, with three more golds among them. Canoeist Emma Wiggs won the VL2 200-metre event, while in the athletics, high jumper Jonathan Broom Edwards claimed his first Paralympic gold. And Paralympic debutant Owen Miller won the T20 1500 metres. Finally tonight, we're returning to our roots. Few histories fascinate people more than their own. Exploring your past in the modern world can be a frustrating business, often involving dusty records and a lot of time. To help, a team of surveyors are spending seven years mapping, photographing and digitalizing the Church of England's 19,000 graveyards using kits which would look at home on a Ghostbusters film. So if you need to trace your ancestry, now you know. Who are you going to call? Etched onto every stone is the story of someone's ancestor. If only their descendants can find it in a maze of memorials. Well now, surveyors are aiming to walk every row of every one of the Church of England's 19,000 graveyards, mapping millions of headstones. What he's got on board that backpack is five cameras, which are taking a photograph every half second, two laser scanners, and from that information... Hello and welcome to Thursday's program. Coming up tonight, coming up tonight, coming up tonight a couple of faces. ...stone and feature within the churchyard. Starting here in Cumbria, the project will also digitise church records to, to create Thursday. a vast national database of who's buried where. Hello. A pilot involving two churches is already online. When the system's up and running, you'll be Hello. able to bring Hello. up Welcome a map to the Thursday Thursday church program. Program. Coming Click up tonight, on any grave and of find exam. out who's buried there, along with some information about them and even an image of where they're Hello. buried. Hello. Welcome to Thursday's program. program. Coming, Coming up tonight, looking at turn of exam. Faces. Search the entire database for them. Technologically, it's a big step up from the current system. If you're looking for Mrs. Smith, Hello and welcome we to Thursday's to programme. This Coming church up tonight, has been meticulously well organised, but still relies on index cards together with paper maps of the plots. Too time-consuming for many vicars who say a new database will help them too. People who are looking to research family trees, family history, local history, don't have to just be channelled through the church. Vicars have got a lot of other things to do. They don't want to be dealing with lots of requests for family Hello history. and welcome to this Thursday. This opens it up to absolutely everybody. But for some, documenting gravestones is nothing new. Hello family and welcome to Thursday. historians like William Bundred have been doing it for years. He says making it more accessible is good, but there are limits to what you can find out from an armchair with an app. It depends on what you want to get out of it. I mean, whether you want to be a, a sort of a, a number-crunching genealogist or you want to look and at the lives and, uh, uh, and the places that, that your ancestors lived in, um, which I think is part of the fun. William thinks the surveyor's goal of mapping every churchyard within seven years may be a little ambitious. But if they can, it will soon be far easier to find our way back to those who were here before us. Ben Chapman, News at 10, in the Lake District. That's quite a project. And that's it from us. From me and the rest of the News at 10 team, have a great weekend and thank you for watching. Good night.